Welcome to Lucid Horizon, a talk show about uh, the relationship between democracy and education from IDEO TV, uh, this uh, think tank that brings experts on various issues together to unpack the, the very topics that are related to um, democracy in the most troubled parts of the world. This week we have Professor Matthew Bunn from Harvard uh, Kennedy School to help us understand the uh, negotiation, the nuclear negotiation between the United States and the European and Russia and China and the Islamic Republic in Iran. Um, Professor Bunn um, is uh, a James Schlesinger Professor um, of uh, National Security and Foreign Policy at Harvard uh, Kennedy School. His research interests includes a wide range of issues related to nuclear technology, including terrorism and nuclear arms control and proliferation and uh, he has uh, been um, uh, uh, involved in, in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy as a study director at the National Academy of Sciences and as editor of Arm Control today. Professor Bond, welcome to IDEA. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, so um, the nuclear negotiation uh, about which probably you're more informed than, uh, than we are, uh, has been ongoing for, for quite a while, for almost two decades. And um, in 2015, a Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, was uh, negotiated and eventually agreed on with the uh, Obama administration, um, uh, which, which within, I believe, a year and a half to two years uh, after the agreement went into effect, President Trump basically exited and took the United States out of the agreement and uh, for the last two and a half to three years, uh, a bunch of uh, sanctions uh, have been imposed on, uh, on the Islamic Republic in Iran. And uh, now we are in the second round of negotiations in Vienna between the new administration in Tehran and, uh, um, and Joseph Biden's administration. First of all, could you tell us a little bit about the history of nuclear programs in Iran and whether whether uh, there is any hope for a second round of negotiation to arrive at a conclusion? Well, I very much doubt this round will be the one that arrives at a conclusion. I still have uh, modest hopes that we that the sides will be able to get back to uh, a compliance for compliance accord. That is, everybody goes back to the original deal. Um, the original deal uh, was, of course, a compromise between Iran and the P5 plus one, that is the permanent five members of the Security Council uh, plus Germany, or from the European perspective, the EU three plus three. Um, it's a little bit of a misleading uh, name in that uh, the European Union was also centrally involved in the negotiations. But in any case, the original deal would have lifted those U.S. sanctions that were imposed for nuclear reasons, not other U.S. sanctions, all European Union sanctions and all U.N. sanctions in return for a number of nuclear steps uh, by Iran intended to ensure that it would take at least a year for Iran to produce enough material for a nuclear bomb should it ever choose to do so. And to expand the monitoring and verification of Iran's nuclear activities. Now, after President Trump pulled out in 2018, uh, Iran for a year remained in compliance with the deal, even though it was suffering the substantial sanctions that President Trump imposed. And I should say that President Trump also imposed what are called secondary sanctions, meaning that if any other country or company threatened uh, to work with Iran, it would get uh, American sanctions. And so that scared off, even though the sanctions were only U.S. unilateral sanctions, it scared off companies all over the world from uh, working uh, with Iran and engaging in trade and investment uh, with Iran. So um, we, the sides came back after President uh, Biden took office. 
it took them, the Biden administration, some time to get organized as to how they were going to handle these negotiations. But they came back in the spring while uh, Rouhani uh, was still president of the Islamic Republic. Uh, but the sides were unable during the time when Rouhani was still in office to reach agreement. Uh, Iran then called a substantial pause uh, after the new government uh, took office and the sides came back to the table. As you say, this is now the second round under the new, uh, more hawkish uh, Raisi government. Um, at the moment, the sides appear to be mostly deadlocked. Iran has made uh, a number of new demands and the West is still uh, asking for uh, Iranian agreement to at least commit to further talks to extend the restraints further in time. Uh, after all, six years of the original uh, sunset clauses are gone now uh, since uh, it's been six years since the implementation of the nuclear deal. Uh, and Iran has made a very substantial progress uh, in its enrichment program. Uh, progress from Iran's point of view, very nervous making from a uh, U.S or Israeli or Arab uh, point of view. Iran now has the capability, should it choose to do so, to, to produce enough material for one bomb in probably about a month. All right. Uh, so I mean, this, this question and this analysis begs the question of uh, what's the big deal about a country having having a big uh, one bomb or two bombs, or for that matter, 10 bombs. Uh, the United States has a stockpile of God knows six, 7,000, you know, thousands. Um, Russia, the same, China, all the big powers. Uh, is a single bomb in the hand of the Islamic Republic, does it pose that much threat to the peace and security of the world that the government in Iran is banking on basically blackmailing the rest of the world by the threat of development of the sensitive technology and the assembly of a, of a bomb? Well, first of all, no one believes that Iran would stop at one nuclear weapon if it went in the path of nuclear weapons. Um, the reality is that the vast majority of states on Earth, including Iran, are non-nuclear weapon state parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They have agreed never to acquire uh, nuclear weapons. Iran, unfortunately, has violated that agreement and its safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency in the past. It now argues that it is in compliance uh, with those agreements. In fact, it claims it never violated them. That's not correct. Um, uh, but even today, Iran continues to provide information to International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors that the IEA judges to be false um, and refuses to allow uh, the IEA to follow up on uh, matters such as the detection of uranium particles that made by uh, humans at undeclared sites. So Iran's neighbors, both the Gulf states and Israel, are extremely nervous about uh, how the region would look and how it would change the balance of power uh, if uh, Iran were to acquire nuclear weapons. And the United States, for decades, has had as a major component of its foreign policy uh, stemming the spread of nuclear weapons to additional states or, for that matter, to terrorist groups, um, and has uh, exerted considerable power even against its own allies when they were uh, pursuing nuclear weapons and has successfully stopped nuclear weapons programs in quite a number of states. One of the uh, interesting and positive facts about the nuclear world is there are now more states that started nuclear weapons programs and gave them up than there are states with nuclear weapons. So our efforts to stop such programs succeed more often than they fail even in the relatively rare cases where states start down that path in the first place. I remain optimistic that um, we will manage to convince Iran uh, not to cross the threshold to actually producing nuclear weapons. Um, but I am less optimistic than I was a decade ago. 
And I suppose all your analysis is based on the assumption that uh, whatever you know about the nuclear activity of uh, the Islamic Republic is what the international community has access to. What if there is a clandestine operation uh, that uh, to which uh, the IAEA or the P5 plus one or no one else has access to? And what if Iran has a parallel uh, nuclear development program that we will never know anything about and will remain secret? You know, after, after all, Israel is a nuclear power that remains ambiguous and whole, keeps an ambiguous position with respect to its position of nuclear arsenal. What if Iran wants to um, follow suit and have a parallel clandestine and secret operation while negotiating with all the exposed portions of the program? They have this secret program that eventually will result in to bomb and, uh, and defeat the purpose of negotiation. So that is definitely a concern. Uh, and that is the reason to make sure that any agreement has uh, effective verification and to continue to focus intelligence efforts on making sure that uh, any secret activity would be revealed. Now, the bad news is that the technology Iran has been pursuing for nuclear material production, which is the hardest part of making a bomb, centrifuges are small and easy to hide. The good news is that so far the international community has repeatedly detected uh, secret facilities uh, in Iran. Uh, first the Natanz enrichment facility, then the uh, various uh, R&D facilities at places like Kalalia Electric, then the uh, secret facility uh, underneath a mountain at Fordow, uh, and so on. Um, the, uh, there have been a series of incidents uh, in Iran in recent years involving uh, sabotage or murder, uh, apparently by Israeli uh, intelligence, the murder of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, who led Iran's nuclear weapons effort back in the day when Iran had a nuclear weapons effort that was mostly terminated in late 2003. Um, uh, there was a sabotage of the Natanz enrichment plant, the largest enrichment plant in Iran, that apparently destroyed thousands of centrifuges, although Iran, according to the latest inspection information, appears to have uh, installed replacement centrifuges and have recovered from that sabotage. There was also a sabotage of the facility where Iran assembles the more advanced centrifuges it's now working on. Um, Iran appears to have recovered from that sabotage uh, as well. Um, but I think all of these are also designed to send a signal to Iran that its nuclear program is penetrated by foreign intelligence and that it should not try to go the secret route because it will be found out. Um, they, as, since 2002, where the nuclear program of Islamic Republic was exposed, uh, there have been basically two Republican and two uh, Democratic administrations uh, having in policies that vary in some cases and similar in others uh, with respect to with respect to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, it seems to me that the most effective counter policy to the Iranian policy of uh, pursuing the nuclear technology development has been the policies of uh, President Trump. What is your opinion about President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA and the application of severe, as they characterize the back-breaking um, sanctions against the Iranian economy that virtually brought it to its halt, and within one administration of President Rouhani, it quadrupled the price of dollar versus Iranian currency exchange. In other words, Iranian currency exchange lost um, almost five to ten times of its uh, international value and uh, basically brought the uh, economy to a grinding halt. And uh, assuming that the Iranian government only understands and uh, sees the language of force, 
And so far, this has been the most effective way of bringing them to negotiating tables. What's wrong with continuing the sanctions until they abandon all the programs in every scale? Because that's not going to happen. Sanctions have been effective so far. Uh, yeah, the Trump era sanctions have been effective only in causing pain, not in changing behavior. Uh, what we have today as a result of Trump's, in my view, foolish pullout from the deal is an Iran much closer to nuclear weapons and posing much more of a danger, therefore, to its neighbors than it did uh, before. Um, we have Iran that was limited at enriching to 3.67 percent U-235, now enriching to 60 percent U-235, very close to uh, what it would use in a nuclear weapon. Um, we have Iran with uh, much more experience with advanced centrifuges that can enrich uranium faster and could either facilitate a breakout at known facilities or allow a smaller uh, and easier to hide secret facility. We have Iran with much less monitoring because it ended the extra monitoring called for under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. In every dimension of the nuclear problem, the situation is much, much worse than it was before uh, President Trump uh, pulled out. Now, Iran's neighbors would point out that the nuclear problem isn't the only problem, that uh, Iran also uh, supports armed groups throughout the region. Iran has a missile program. Neither of those were limited by the nuclear deal. Um, and having more money from the lifting of sanctions during the time the deal was in place gave Iran more flexibility to provide money to those armed groups or to that missile program. Um, whereas the Trump era sanctions are presumably making those things more difficult. Nonetheless, uh, we don't see any huge diminution in uh, Iranian uh, activities uh, in the region since the Trump sanctions. We did see uh, a downtick uh, after the killing of uh, General Soleimani. Um, it, it appears that Iran uh, took a pause in some of the things that might have provoked further American action uh, after uh, that occurred. Uh, but I would expect that we may still see some further Iranian retaliation uh, for that and for the death of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh uh, over time. Uh, there is, as you know, an ongoing uh, shadow war in the Middle East, uh, especially between Iran and Israel, um, but also between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates to some extent. Um, and uh, the suffering that is being caused, suffering caused by you know, sanctions within Iran, suffering caused by war in Yemen, caused by war in Syria, um, caused by uh, fighting and poor governance in Iraq um, is very substantial. And Ultimately, what's needed is for Iran and its neighbors to find a way toward uh, a different kind of relationship that allows their peoples to suffer less. Obviously, the Iranian government, as you very well know, uh, subscribes to a, a, a version of Islam. Uh, that's, that rivals those of Saudi Arabia and the rest of the uh, Arab countries in the Middle East. And uh, there is, uh, not only there is a rivalry and hostility between Iran and Israel, uh, there's also um, a huge rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and Iran is constantly instigating um, Shiite groups and arming them and providing them intelligence to um, stir up uh, unrest in the Shiite dominant uh, provinces of Saudi Arabia, which are oil rich regions of Saudi Arabia. Iran has uh, sponsored the, the uh, Yemen uh, insurgencies uh, against Saudi Arabia, and Iran has armed uh, Hezbollah to the tune of, of 100,000 missiles to some accounts. 
uh, which are all aimed at Israel. Uh, also, Iran prevented the uh, Bashar Assad regime from collapsing by introducing direct military arm and assistance to, to that regime, uh, causing dislocation of some 4 million people and uh, the massacre of 500,000 Syrians. So against all this backdrop, why is the international community? So uh, actually, before I get to that question, uh, they, is, is it true that uh, the sanctions, there are basically three classes of sanctions, as you alluded into. There are those classes of sanctions that are directly related to the nuclear enrichment program, the class of sanctions that has to do with the proxy groups and Iran's support for this for the terrorists in the region, and uh, the uh, uh, so-called human rights sanctions. Uh, the uh, demands by the Iranian government to remove all the sanctions as part of this round two of the JCPO negotiations obviously is not possible to be accepted by the U.S. or by the Europeans in that regard. Is that true? So, um, it is true that the Iranians are asking for a removal of all sanctions, and it is also true that the United States is unlikely to agree to that. Um, there are people who have discussed um, the concept of a more for more uh, deal. As you know, the, the Biden administration and, and Israel and others would like to see uh, what Secretary of State Blinken calls a longer and stronger deal. That is something that would extend the restraints of the JCPOA for a longer period of time and make them uh, tighter constraints. Um, but an obvious question is why would Iran agree to that? Um, the United States today has less leverage than it had before, not more leverage, because uh, now the credibility of U.S. promises to lift sanctions if, if the United States gets what it wants are completely shot by the fact that we promised before and then President Trump reneged on the deal. Uh, uh, and we have a harder line government in Iran than the one that negotiated the deal. So why that new government uh, with facing less American leverage would negotiate a deal that's better for the United States and worse for Iran uh, is a little bit of a mystery. Um, so, I, but what people have talked about is, well, uh, if the United States offered more than the sanctions that were lifted in the original deal, then maybe you could get a longer and stronger uh, agreement. And that's where the more for more idea has come from. Um, everything you say about uh, Iran's behavior is correct. Uh, although, of course, uh, Iran, Iranian officials would have uh, a similarly long list of complaints about US and Israeli and Arab uh, threats to uh, Iran. Uh, uh, but the reality is all of that would be worse if Iran had a nuclear weapon um, and was had a deterrent that would uh, protect it when it was engaging in all of these other activities. So uh, there was a reason why, in fact, even the Israelis originally urged the Americans, focus on the nuclear issue, the rest of what Iran does, we don't like, it's bad, but we can handle it. But if they have nuclear weapons, that we can't handle. Um, and so that was the reason why the P5 plus one, which by the way, is not just the United States, the whole, you know, all of the permanent five members of the Security Council and so on, focused on this nuclear issue as the first step. And everyone involved in that nuclear deal envisioned that it would be, as some put it, not a ceiling, but a floor. That the experience of being able to serve its own interest through cooperation with the West would provide a foundation to build up uh, other agreements to address some of the other issues and possibly build a different relationship with Iran over time. Obviously, none of that happened. We're in a situation where the relationship between Iran and the West is uh, more hostile, and there's more 
tension and conflict in the Middle East than there was before? Um, United States has the history of relationship with Soviet Union during the Cold War, uh, which lasted some 70 years uh, after, the, after the Bolshevik Revolution in, uh, in Russia. Uh, and eventually the, this competition and the arms race between the two countries came to uh, end in, in the 1989 by the implosion of Soviet Union and the decommissioning of the communist regime in, in that country. Uh, can the United States take a page from that experience of uh, Cold War and imposition of a very expensive arms race to Soviet Union, which eventually the economy of Soviet Union collapsed under that very expensive endeavor that, uh, that the U.S. basically imposed on Russia, and they, they could actually manage deterrence in spite of the huge stockpile of nuclear weapons and inter continental ballistic missiles that, that Russia had at the time, but the United States actually used this, its economic leverage, the livelihood and the, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the economic viability of the United States and capitalism compared to the Soviet socialist system, and eventually basically forced them to throw in the towel. Could that model be successful against the Islamic Republic in Iran? So uh, I see that history a little bit differently. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, it was the vitality of the capitalist system and the poor performance uh, and rot of the communist system that ultimately led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the United States, following some incredibly dangerous moments like the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, really focused on making sure that we would have uh, nuclear restraint with the Soviet Union and clear guardrails so that um, the dangers of the nuclear standoff were reduced. Uh, I see what, we're, what the United States is engaged in with Iran in a somewhat similar light, that the dangers of waiting for change in the Islamic Republic will be much less if we can avoid the Islamic Republic being armed with nuclear weapons. Um, and that uh, it may be quite some time before change comes, just as it was quite some time before change came in the Soviet Union. But we need to try to avoid war and avoid nuclear weapons for that period of time until change does come. Um, and you think that all the incentives that uh, negotiations like JCPOA 1 and JCPOA 2 are providing Iran uh, are sufficient for them to abandon pursuit of nuclear technology? Um, no, in, I don't which, think Iran's... In the light I don't think Iran's ever going to abandon pursuit of nuclear technology. Uh, the question is not nuclear technology, but nuclear weapons. And the question, Iran already today has the technologies it needs if it wants to go to nuclear weapons. The question today is a political decision by the Iranian leadership. So far, since 2003, that's 18 years, the world has managed to convince Iran not to take that political decision to go toward nuclear weapons through an adroit combination of diplomacy, sanctions, uh, threats of military force, um, and other means, including sabotage. Um, uh, I remain at least somewhat hopeful that we will be able to convince Iran not to cross that threshold. Does that mean Iran is going to agree to, you know, abandon uh, nuclear energy? No. Is it going to abandon its enrichment capacity? No. It sees that as key leverage against the West that, you know, it feels has done as many awful things to Iran as you have listed that Iran has done to various countries in the region. Uh, and after all, Iran has suffered terribly from sanctions, from a whole campaign of murder and uh, sabotage of key facilities, 
um, uh, its list of complaints uh, is long and uh, is real. Um, uh, so I, I think there needs to be nuclear restraint, but there also needs to be negotiation toward finding a different modus vivendi between Iran and its neighbors and Iran and the West. After all, both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are now engaged in back-channel discussions with the Iranians trying to find uh, a different uh, approach to dealing with their disagreements. Um, it's my hope that some of those talks will prove successful. After all, those countries had a very much less hostile relationship with Iran in, say, the 1990s than they do today. Um, um, we alluded into a number of uh, actors and players vis-a-vis uh, -vis the nuclear negotiation and the nuclear issue with Iran, uh, including the United States and its allies in the region, Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia. Europeans have their, they're pursuing their own interests in these negotiations, and obviously Russia and China have an entirely different agenda. But there is one player that's been uh, inconspicuously and conspicuously left out of uh, this entire deal, and that's Iranian people. The Iranian regime is extremely unpopular among the Iranian people. Iranian people are pro-Western, pro-open society, upward-looking, highly educated, and they have a burning desire of assimilating with the rest of the world. They like American products, American technology. They come in flocks to European and American universities. And, they, and they're highly, highly westernized and modern in nature, um, in millions and millions. And they're adamantly and strictly against the Iranian government and its ideology and Armageddon ideology. Do you think the West has to capitalize on this uh, split between the Iranian people and the Islamic Republic and bring the Iranian people, give the Iranian people a seat on the negotiation and insist on the human rights sanctions to not to be removed and not to be a part of nuclear negotiation and keep those uh, sanctions having their own characteristic unless and until the government of Iran stops abusing human rights in Iran. So first of all, I consider myself uh, an expert on nuclear matters, not an expert on the internal politics of Iran. Um, uh, but I think the situation in Iran is is murkier than you describe, and uh, there's not a, a uh, unified view. Uh, there is, in fact, very broad support uh, in Iran for Iran's nuclear program. Uh, I would say almost overwhelming support one of the uh, uh, ironies of history is that the person who signed the first contract for cooperation with the black market nuclear network led by Pakistan's AQ Khan was Musavi, who later became the leader of the Green Movement. Um, uh, so, uh, Number one, it's not clear that if there were a different government in Iran, it would mean there wouldn't be any nuclear program in Iran. There was a secret nuclear weapons program in Iran under the Shah as well. Um, uh, so uh, secondly, uh, the reality is, uh, you know, when a government is in power, it's in control of what happens in that country to a significant degree. and. It's the body that other governments negotiate with. Uh, so it's not like the United States gets to determine who Iran's representatives are going to be uh, when Iran comes to the negotiating table. Uh, Iran, the United States can determine its own policies, of course. It can determine which sanctions to lift and which sanctions not to lift. Uh, it's my expectation that uh, the full scope of U.S. sanctions probably isn't going to get lifted until there's quite a different relationship between the United States and Iran, and that that very different relationship probably isn't going to happen unless there's some progress with respect to political freedoms uh, within Iran. Uh, 
But I will say the United States has quite a number of allies uh, where there are uh, even fewer political freedoms. After all, Saudi Arabia has, uh, you know, if anything, less political freedom uh, than there is uh, in Iran. Um, and there was a time during the Cold War uh, when most of the world's uh, dictatorships, at least the non-communist dictatorships, were governments supported by the United States. So um, the United States uh, will sometimes um, uh, grit its teeth and ignore certain human rights issues, uh, as they say, for reasons of state. Well, it's not just a human right, but it's this lethal cocktail of human rights and anti-Western sentiments that the Iranian government is representing. I mean, Saudi Arabia at least is a player in the international politics. Uh, all those uh, third world dictators, such as the South American you know, dictatorships of the 70s and 80s, uh, were not really threatening their livelihood or the Western economy, as you hear. These... Um, very harsh rhetorics that is coming from Friday, Friday prayer um, 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 speakers of the you, Iranian there's uh, plenty, regime. There's plenty of harsh rhetoric against the West in Iran. The notion that Iran, without nuclear weapons, poses any fundamental threat to the West, I think, though, is overstated. Iran is uh, a big country for its region, a pretty small country on a global scale. Um, you know, in military terms, uh, its defense budget is a small fraction of the defense budget, even of the Gulf states, uh, let alone um, the enormous defense budgets of, you know, the United States and the rest of the P5 plus one and so on. Its economy is a small fraction of uh, even the region's economies, let alone the world's economies. It's important because of its oil and gas. It's important because it has, as you say, uh, an uh, especially uh, educated uh, population. And it's important because of its strategic location. But in terms of uh, really being a serious global power, I would not say, or having the ability to seriously uh, interfere with the global economy, I, I don't think Iran's in that league. Um, that, that brings me to another aspect, another dimension to our conversation, and uh, that is the role of China and Russia, and the fact that you know we had our own unipolar moment after the downfall of Soviet Union for about ten to twenty years, which we basically uh, took the leisure of invading Afghanistan and Iraq during that time, and relinquished uh, the superpowerhood status at least the economic superpower with status to China, and now China is breathing on our neck as far as the economic competition is concerned. Uh, it seems to me that the Iranian government is relying on their friendship and the support of Chinese, both in international venues such as JCPOA and the United Nations, and the signing of a 25-year economic agreement, which is worth $400 billion with China and some kind of support, the military support that's receiving from Russia. So, so now, now we are not in the unipolar moment anymore. We are back into the uh, highly, highly, highly polar world, you know. And in this situation, unlike the old Cold War, which uh, competition was mostly along the military hardware, and there was really not much economic competition between the capitalist world and the socialist world, this time around, the bipolarity has an entirely different nature. The Chinese are presenting a stiff economic competition to the United States and to the Western world in general, and then combined with the military hardware that Russia can offer, we could be in an entirely new era of Cold War, a Cold War that a combination of economic power of China and the military power of Russia could really make life more difficult for us than, than before and give breathing room to prior regimes like Islamic Republic. Do you think that the United States has to take that into account and get closer to its uh, European allies? We saw some kind of a drift between the US and, and Europe during the Trump administration, and even during the uh, negotiations in 
CPOA, we've seen some differences between European position and the US position. Do you think that we have to look at the problem of, I mean, actually the problem of the world in general, but in this particular case of JCPOA, in the light of economic success of, uh, of the other superpower and its alliance, at least in some circles in the One Belt, One Road and some other activities that Russia and China have gotten into. into uh, do you think that uh, in the future uh, that the economic success of China will make it difficult for the United States to achieve its political goals in negotiating with smaller states, smaller power states? Well, so far, I would say both Russia and China have been surprisingly helpful in um, reaching the original JCPOA and in the talks um, so far. In fact, I uh, would argue that Russia played a very uh, important facilitating role in making the current talks uh, take place and, and making sure that even the new Iranian government would would at least come back to the table. Um, uh, now, that being said, you're absolutely correct that uh, China is uh, sees opportunities in Iran, um, is not enthusiastic about sanctions in general, uh, and sanctions on Iran in particular. Um, and that uh, Russia was quite e eager to make some military sales once the ban on military sales imposed by the United Nations expired. Uh, and I think the reality is, as the U.S. relative power declines, which is inevitable as other countries get stronger and stronger over time, uh, it will get more difficult for the United States to have its own way. Um, but probably the United States shouldn't have its own way on everything in international affairs. I do think on the spread of nuclear weapons, we're fortunate in that Russia and the United States built the nuclear nonproliferation regime together. China has now decided that uh, while it stood away from that regime originally, that the regime serves its interests. Uh, as have all of the other major powers. Uh, so I, I think the United States will have a lot of help over the years in uh, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. On a lot of other issues, uh, we may be at loggerheads with Russia and with China. I should note, uh, you mentioned the military power of Russia. It's true Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons. It's true Russia has some advanced arms that it can use in various places. But Russia's defense budget is about a tenth of the American defense budget. Um, it's really not in a position to compete in the way that it did, that the Soviet Union did in the Cold War. Um, China, both in economic and in military terms, is really the, the long-term sort of peer competitor of the United States. Russia is a peer of the United States in nuclear weapons terms and not in really any other terms, uh, except perhaps uh, culture. <laughs> uh, well, in your book, Preventing Black Market Trade in Nuclear Technology, you offer a compelling analysis of failure of policy, intelligence, and, and, uh, and policies of the past, past governments, specifically administrations in the United States, and the challenges facing the control of um, uh, illegal nuclear technology transfer. Is it true that without the explicit or implicit role of owners of nuclear technology, other countries could not have obtained it? For instance, the transfer of technology from Soviet Union to China and India, from China to Pakistan, from France to Israel, and from China as I said, to Pakistan, from Pakistan to the Islamic Republic. So even though, you know, we kind of talk about the pay lip service to the non-proliferation, but uh, it seems to me that, you know, the, the big nuclear governments have themselves played a role in at least arming their own allies to, with, with nuclear technology. And now that the genie is out of the bottle, we are, we are trying to put it back into bottle by 
Yeah, by right. coming down hard right. on, on these small yeah, countries. Right. I see the history quite differently than you see it. Uh, all of those events occurred decades and decades ago, except for the Pakistani transfer to Iran. Um, they occurred before the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and its uh, associated regime was really in place and took strength. What the treaty was about, in part, was the United States and the Soviet Union having learned that it was problematic to transfer nuclear weapons capabilities to their allies, in part because it meant the other side would transfer to their allies. And Article One of the treaty is basically the two superpowers saying to each other, look, I won't give it to my allies if you won't give it to your allies. Uh, it's only Article Two of the treaty that's all the non-nuclear weapon states saying, and we won't get it, um, and we'll accept um, uh, international inspection uh, to ensure that. That's Articles 2 and 3. Um, so um, I, I think there is now a strong international consensus against the spread of nuclear weapons, which is why it has been possible to pull together an international coalition to oppose Iran's efforts to edge toward a nuclear weapons capability. Um, I will say, uh, though, uh, one more thing, which is how successful this global effort has been. There are today, out of almost 200 countries in the world, only nine that have nuclear weapons. 30 years ago, there were nine countries that had nuclear weapons. We added North Korea, but we subtracted South Africa. Admittedly, that's a terrible trade, but to have no net increase in 30 years is an amazing public policy success story. And I remain somewhat optimistic that 30 years from now, we might have the same or even a smaller number of states with nuclear weapons. That's not inevitable. It will take a lot of work and a lot of good policy to make that happen. But I think it remains possible and ought to be our goal. Um, now, in terms of the trade in technology, um, I think that um, essentially every nuclear weapons program has benefited from technology from outside, even the original one from the United States. Um, but I think that um, at the same time, uh, there's a lot that countries can do if the technology is cut off to build it on their own. Uh, it'll take longer. It will cost more. Uh, so the efforts to stop technology flow can't be the only part of the effort to stem the spread of nuclear weapons. What it does is it it buys time, it slows things down so that diplomacy and other means of action have time to work. I think it can still play that role, uh, but um, it is getting more difficult as things like 3D printing make it possible to manufacture things in a wide range of places where you weren't able to manufacture them before. Yes. Um, and uh, we only have have uh, about three more minutes before the end of this interview, and I have this question that uh, I, I have to ask even if you just give me a very short answer. Matthew Kronick in his book, The Logic of an American Nuclear Strategy, argues that for decades the U.S. nuclear weapons policy has been that the United States only needs the, the, the ability to, uh, to absorb an enemy nuclear attack and still be able to respond with a devastating counterattack. Uh, but so if that is the U.S. policy, why is that not applied towards the negotiations with Iran? Obviously, the U.S. has more than ability to absorb uh, any challenge that the Iranian government uh, can offer the, U the U.S. arsenal and the U.S. The United, States, firepower. the United States doesn't want to live in a nuclear deterrent relationship with every country on Earth. The more fingers that are on the nuclear button 
the more likely it is somebody's going to press that nuclear button. We lived in a nuclear deterrent relationship with the Soviet Union because we didn't have any choice. The uh, Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. They had enough that could survive an American attack that we didn't have any ability to get rid of them. Uh, and so we pursued uh, arms control and confidence building measures and hotlines and military to military dialogue and so on to try to reduce the very real and serious dangers of that situation. We desperately want to avoid having more really dangerous situations like that, including nuclear weapons in Iran. Well, thank you very much, Professor Bond, for your gracious agreement of uh, giving us an hour of your time to discuss this very important issue. Your insight is very appreciated, and uh, uh, we are hoping that you know in the future we can uh, count on being with you uh, about this uh, particular very important issue, the issue that's important for the international community, as well as Iranians who watch this program on Idea TV. Uh, I thank you again and hope to see you in this show once again in, in the near future. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you very much.